Well, greetings, Life Church, and welcome. It's great to have you with us today. Let me start like this. A number of you watching today are on the brink of a breakthrough that you've waited for and hoped for for a long time, yet you've still wondered about. And it's be, here's why. It's because we are about to experience something here as a group at Life Church that has the potential to define the rest of your life on earth for the better. Because a purposeful step forward in this season could pay dividends that you may not have even thought possible. And here's why I know this to be true. Lots of us have been trusting God and waiting for him to bring something about in our lives, something that we feel like he's promised us or something that we've uh, heard from him. Uh, maybe a deep desire that you've had for a long time and you've been praying about. And lots of us have been waiting for a long time. You might think too long, probably. And I know we trust God and we trust his timing, but a lot of us have prayed that prayer, haven't we? How long, God, how long? We've prayed that. And we're not gonna give up. We're not gonna throw in the towel. Lots of us have been walking with God long enough to know that he is our lifeline. So he's our only hope. Any measure of cutting ourselves off from him is like cutting our own throat. And we're not gonna do that. So we've come to this question. In the meantime, what do we do? In the meantime, in this time that we're waiting for God to bring about what we believe he's, spro he's spoken, what he's promised, what do we do in the meantime? Well, I stated something that I believe wholeheartedly to be true and very timely right now, and it's this. In the meantime, like right now, while things are not as we hoped, right now in the midst of whatever it is that we're going through, there is something that God wants us to know and something that God wants us to do. And what he wants us to know is this, and this is what we reviewed over the last few weeks. God is not absent. God is not apathetic. And God is not angry with you. He is none of those things. Therefore, that is not why things are as they are. In the meantime, while things are not as we hope, he wants us to be settled in on that truth. Now, beyond that, there is also something that God wants us to do. He wants us to do. And I introduced this with some detail over the last couple of weeks. I gave you a look at what we are calling the stool, the stool. Just picture a three-legged stool. All three legs are necessary for this to remain standing. If you take one away, the thing falls over. And I introduce this as a life-changing approach to physical health, spiritual health, and relational health. The three legs represent the three facets of this endeavor that we're doing together. First, exercise. Second, devotional readings. And third, discussion and prayer. It's a three-step process done five times per week with a partner or two, but no more. It takes about 45 minutes to do, but you can go longer if you want. And that's great if you want to dive deeper. You get out of it what you put in, so I would encourage you to do so. But we're going to see over the next couple of weeks how this is absolutely supernatural. Somehow it has exponential payoff. It's not just the sum of its three parts. Together, somehow they ignite. And it will revolutionize your physical health and your spiritual vigor if you give it a chance. If you give it a chance. So I'm asking all of us to commit to this 30-day experiment together, and it starts right after this coming Sunday, February 12th. Right after that, we begin this exercise. Now, last Sunday, I unpacked just the physical benefits of doing this, because they're much more widespread than you'd think. Uh, we looked at a TED Talk that demonstrated how your brain gets revived by physical exercise, and beyond that, how all four of the feel-good chemicals that are in our own bodies get released through this exercise and this process that we call the stool. If you missed last week, you need to see that one. Look on YouTube again and, and uh, catch up on that message there. All right, I recognize this. Any challenge that has to do with physical exercise or personal devotions, much less them together, it tends to bring up a similar feeling in almost all of us. And uh, it was represented well by this little quote that we, we came out of this book called Everybody Matters by Gary Thomas. The very first words of the book are this. He says, I live in a crucible between impressive success and miserable failure when it comes to personal discipline. <laughs> That's most of us, if we're being honest. We have varying levels of success and failure represented in a group like ours. Um, but remember, regardless of what comes to mind when we're faced with an opportunity like this, um, remember, God is alive and well. He is not finished with you yet, and he's not finished with us either. So no matter how old you are, what kind of challenges you face, 
even the level of trepidation that you experience in considering a program like this, remember this. In Ephesians chapter 2, there's some great words. It says, God is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, beyond all that we can ask or imagine, according to his power at work within us. And how certain we can be to have God at work inside of us, when what we're endeavoring to do is exactly what he desires for us. I mean, he wants us to honor him with body and soul, and that's what we're trying to do. Now, when, when Jesus was asked, what was most important, like above all, in Luke chapter 10, someone asked him about that, he answered simply but certainly. Here's what he said. He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Loving God with all of our strength means we do this by giving our best to God, not a broken down, weak body or afraid, neglected soul. We give them our best. So the first leg of the stool is physical exercise. We talked about that. Now, today, the second leg of the stool is devotional readings. In other words, filling our soul with the pure food of God's word and also some helpful readings that assist us in applying God's word to our lives. So in the stool, we do our exercise, which is whatever it is that you choose that you're going to do for your exercise. And then we sit down and read the devotional material together. And remember, it's not just reading to get through the word, it's reading to get the word through you. Big difference. Now, what Bonnie and I have done here is where it really has diverted from ordinary devotional habits. Because yes, we're reading to learn, of course, but we're also purposefully perking our ears up in order to hear from God. We want to hear from God. Of course we do. We all want to hear from God. But I recognize that we all live in the real world. As followers of Jesus, we don't like float above the ground two inches above terra firma. We don't float and we don't glow in the dark. We're all real people with jobs and families and responsibilities and stuff. None of us have a red phone to heaven and none of us are hearing the voice of Morgan Freeman coming from the clouds. Now, sure, God can speak to us any way that he wants. I believe that. But most often it comes when we have stopped life for a few minutes and positioned ourselves to listen proactively. So we tune in with your mind and with your heart and really listen to the words that you're reading or your partner in the devotions is reading. Look for something that stands out. Look and listen for thoughts that answer questions that you've been asking in your real life, like your everyday practical life. In uh, Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 12, it says, God speaks here and says, you will call on me and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord. So doesn't entering into this experiment change a little bit? When you think about it that way, like God telling you, God looking at you and saying, I will be found by you. But that's, that's good news. This is not a hollow exercise of obligation. It's quite the opposite. Now I say this with confidence, with some confidence, because I have field tested this successfully, not for a week or for a month, but for four full years I have. Uh, there's just something exponential about the combination of these three elements together. I mean, God met us there and has been able to do in us what we really had varying levels of failure at for about 30 years. It's not just establishing a devotional life. I mean, this goes way beyond that. I've had some stretches of really good disciplined devotional time, but never as fruitful as this new animal. It's completely different. Now, I said this before, we say we want change and we do. But change always seems to involve change, doesn't it? And our flesh wants to flee from that. So think about a new chapter of life with increasing physical health and then a dynamic friendship with God that's growing. Well, those kinds of things are gonna involve something different than previous chapters of life, right? So are we willing to step out and begin? That's the question. Are we willing to step out and begin? Now, let me just share with you a speed bump that we all face, every single one of us. And I don't think I've ever heard this taught on, and I've been avidly listening to teaching since I became a believer many decades ago. This is something I've never even heard addressed. We have more choices today than ever before in history, and it's not even close. We get to choose everything, all day, 
every day. I mean, it's incredible. I mean, my first hour of a day might include choices like, well, what exact temperature do I want my shower? What products do I want to use in the shower? What shampoo, what conditioner, what soap, or what body gel, or something like that. Then, what deodorant, you know? What about hair products? No hair products, which is gonna be? And I realize that I am blessed to even have that option. <laughs> what do I wanna wear? Then it comes to what do I wanna wear? Most of us have a whole closet to consider. What do I wanna eat? Fruit, eggs, oatmeal, juice, muffin, toast, a toast? Well, what kind of toast? White, wheat, rye, 10 grain, cinnamon raisin toast? What'll it be? Coffee, regular or decaf? Espresso, latte, cappuccino, <laughs> macchiato? Frappuccino? What? The, cho the choices are endless. Bonnie steps out of the closet and says, what shoes should I wear? And I say, the black ones. And she says, well, which black ones? I have flat black, gloss black, charcoal, midnight, onyx, obsidian, ebony, jet black, or licorice. Or what about the blue ones, she says. And I say, I need a nap, okay? We rarely think about how many of these choices we have gotten so used to having all the time. What temperature do I want the AC to be all around me? What lighting do I want? What am I gonna listen to in the car? Because radio is primitive. I mean, come on, I gotta have satellite radio because 40 stations is a joke. I need a thousand stations. What am I gonna watch on TV? Because regular cable's a joke. No, no, I need Netflix, Amazon, Paramount, Peacock. I need Hulu, well, Hulu Plus because Hulu's a joke. I need HBO Max, I need Apple TV, I need Orange TV, I need Banana TV. Also, I can sit there with a remote and say, nothing is on. Now, are choices in and of themselves bad? No, not really. But what it has done, it has elevated our feelings to a very, very unhealthy level, not even consciously. And we just kind of assume this is normal life, but it's actually unprecedented in history. In ages past, only royalty got to make the, the amount of choices that we make, and not even that many, really. Now we see it as just a perk of modern American life. We expect it. We demand it. Our ability to choose what we want, what exactly we feel like doing at almost all times, has created a monster. And I'm not just talking about the generation growing up now who has never known anything other. It has created a monster in us as well. It is hard, friends. It is hard to bring ourselves to do anything we don't feel like doing. We're always choosing exactly what we want, so it seems counterintuitive to do anything other. I mean, it seems absurd to us. Why? Because we have elevated our feelings to a point where they actually rule over us. And you hear people say some, something like, well, I'm sorry, it's just the way that I feel. It's just the way I feel. As if there is no changing what I could feel, possibly goes even further, friends. It crosses over even into our relationship with God. Our feelings dictate how we go to God, sometimes how we don't go to God, and here's how. Many of us have been inadvertently trained over the years to shy away from God when something is out of sorts in our lives. In other words, say I'm stuck in some behavioral habit that I know is not God's best for me, and I've tried to fix it, tried to stop it or start it or do whatever it is that God I feel like God wants, but I've failed. I've come up short and nobody likes that. Matter of fact, we hate it. And when we've been around the block enough times on this thing, we've got to file it away. Our, our, our consciousness somehow wants to file this thing away somehow. And so we try to manage it. Now, some people just block it out, try not to think about it anymore and certainly don't bring it up with God anymore. Others try to redefine our falling with a new name so we can kind of Justify it, rationalize it. Well, it's a disorder, it's an addiction. There's just nothing I can do about it. Some others of us just try to temporarily file it away out of our minds and we figure, well, I will get this straightened up as soon as I can. Uh, I mean, I'll get serious about pursuing God when I get this thing in order. I can't bring myself to confess this to God again, no way. I'll go back to God when I've cleaned this thing up. And you know why we do this? We do this because we assume on God. We think, well, this is probably a sin and God's probably mad at me for doing it. And if I go to him, he's just going to say, stop it. That's all he's going to say, stop it. We assume all God wants to say to us is, stop it. No wonder we don't go to him. But anyone who's a, a parent that's listening today, 
You've, you know that you've got much more to communicate with the child that you love other than stop it. You have all kinds of things in your heart that you want to share with them. And God has all kinds of things in his heart that he wants to share with you. Not just stop it. Don't assume on God. Now, please hear me. This is probably the most important thing that you can take away today. Go to God directly and regularly, baggage and all. Go to him regularly and directly, baggage and all. I mean, he's the only one that can help. Why would you avoid God with your greatest need? You can't depend upon yourself. Yourself got you into this mess. Yourself can't get you out. You need a powerful, loving, forgiving God. You know what? That powerful, loving, forgiving God is waiting on you to come to him, waiting with open arms that are very, very strong. He will help you with that baggage. And he might help you in a moment. He might fix it in a moment or a month or a year. But whatever it takes, he never stops loving you or being patient with you. Don't assume otherwise just because we would get impatient. We're not God. Now, when we actually get this, that we go to God with whatever crap we're dragging, it will revolutionize your life and your walk with him. I mean, God knows it all anyway. He still loves you completely and nothing will ever jeopardize that. Nothing. Psalm 34 says this. I love this. He says, this poor man cried out and the Lord heard him and saved him out of his misery. I've always loved that verse. It's so starkly honest. So we take it all to God, the good, the bad, the ugly. And when we allow someone else into that level of honesty as well, it gets even more powerful. This is the dynamic supernatural potential of the stool. And I'm gonna get a little bit more into that next week when we unpack the communal and relational benefits uh, of this experiment together. But I just wanna wrap up today with an encouragement and a challenge. See, we have an opportunity before us right now to enter into a time of growth that can alter the trajectory of your life for the better. It's going to require some openness to do something that you've probably not done before, something different. And changing things is not always that easy. Um, Remember, our feelings are used to being in charge, and we usually kind of buck against this whole thing. Um, And we kind of think that just you know, hope and sincerity and a good desire will bring about life change, but it does not. It requires different action. And God will help us with this. He will. I know that for certain, but it does require different action for all of us. I had a conversation with a, a, a while back with a guy that's in his 40s who is a really a pretty good golfer. And he thought it would be really cool to get really good by the time he turned 50 so he could go play on the senior PGA Tour and make a whole bunch of money and become a household name. Um, he's not the first to think that way. Middle-aged golfers everywhere uh, have those kinds of thoughts. Um, their minds are thinking like this. Well, you know, I could totally do what those guys do. Those guys are old. I mean... By the time you turn 50, aren't you just waiting to die anyway? I could totally do that. So anyway, I I talked to this guy. I asked him about his game. I knew a little bit about it, but not a whole lot. And he was telling me that he beats the guys that he plays with on Saturdays pretty often. And a couple of times he shot scores that he sees guys on TV shoot. Not often, but it happened. So I asked him, you know, I said, he said to me, do you think I have a shot? And I said, sure. Uh, But uh, I'd like to be honest with you if that's okay. You want me to be honest? He seemed a little offended by that, but he said, "Uh, yeah, sure. I said, those guys that you think you can beat, they've been playing competition full time for 30 years or more. When they're not playing, they're pounding balls on the driving range for hours, putting for hours, looking at video to see how they can get better virtually every day. I said, how often do you practice? He said, well, sometimes I hit balls before I go play on Saturday. I said, I'm not talking about warming up. I'm talking about practice, real practice. You know, working on your game to try to get better, getting feedback, working on specific things to try to shave a shot anywhere that you can because the margin for making it or not making it is sometimes less than one stroke. It's razor thin. And he just kind of looked at me for a long time. And, you know, some guys have the eye of the tiger. This guy had the dull stare of the dairy cow. So... Now, some of you have heard of one of the great golfers in history. His name is Ben Hogan. His practice was legendary. And when he was asked about it in an interview, he made a simple statement that golfers everywhere quote all the time, 
but nobody ever puts it in practice, hardly. And what he said was, the secret is in the dirt. The secret's in the dirt. Just means if you're looking for better, better golf, it doesn't come by desire or luck or even sincerity. Those are fine. But if you really want to get better at golf, practice, get feedback, look at video, work on it, hit balls, dig it out of the dirt, he's saying. Now, that reality helped this guy see not what he wished was true, but what was actually true. And he admittedly had no interest in applying himself at that level. He actually chuckled and said, I think I'd rather just be a weekend hero. So desire and sincerity, those are fine, but, but they don't accomplish anything. Change always involves change, putting it into practice. Now, what would be shocking, what would be truly shocking is if someone becomes an expert at something without applying themselves to it. I mean, nobody sits down at a piano for the first time and plays like a virtuoso. Nobody shows up to run the New York City Marathon who only runs to the park and back. Nobody goes up to climb Mount Everest who's only climbed Mount Dora before. No. We train to run marathons and climb mountains and play pianos. That's the most basic idea in the world. We also train for real life with Jesus. That's the most lost idea in the world. It's not magic. It's supernatural. And there is a difference. It is a ongoing cooperation with our Heavenly Father. Now, it is important for us to know that the central obstacle in our relationship with God is not God's aloofness or his remoteness, as though God needed chasing down or coaxing out. And this new approach that we're calling the stool is not a shrewder technique for tracking down an elusive God. No, you know what it is? It is a way of tracking ourselves down in our elusiveness. See, at first we choose the three facets of the stool. Exercise, devotions, discussion. First we choose them and carry them out. But after a while it becomes a part of who we are and they carry us. Now keep in mind, we're not trying to earn anything from God by doing this. You know, just being disciplined does not earn something from God. God doesn't love us more if we practice things like this stool and love us less if we don't. It's not about that. This is rather about experiencing more and more of the presence and the power of Jesus that's available to us now. And it will help us begin to live the life we've always wanted.